Hey everybody and welcome back to the Photogs channel or welcome to the Photogs channel. And what I want to talk about today is format. And what I mean by format is sensor size and different tools for the job as far as photography is concerned. And I want to take this back to the film days. Um, though I've been talking a lot more recently about micro four thirds systems uh, like this Panasonic Lumix G9 here. One of the things that I think people are forgetting about days of film is format. And what I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is when film was your only tool, you had different format cameras for different jobs. You had 35 millimeter, which was considered to be a, a small format camera. And then you had medium format cameras like this Hasselblad here which of course you know has a much bigger negative that's the size of the negative space on on you know medium format cameras and then you had large format cameras which were 4x5s 8x10 view cameras things of that nature now when the world of photography you never had photographers arguing the fact that you know oh for for this you should be using this kind of film or you should be using this format of camera on occasion you get <laughs> little arguments within the portrait and and you know wedding photography genre but the thing was is that really didn't matter you know you didn't go to a photographer and say hey I love your pictures what format camera are you using uh, I mean in some circles you you know some did but you just kind of went yeah okay you know, weird question so how come we're bothered by this or you know, well, I only shoot four thirds or, or three, you know, I only shoot me, you know, full format or, you know, things like the Sony. Why is that conversation coming to be a part of photography now? Now, obviously from time to time, there were discussions within that system of, well, you know, for this type of wedding and my clients want this size of picture, or they're doing this with it. Well then, yeah, for example, for, for wedding photography, this to me is the perfect example. So, when I was shooting weddings pretty much full time, um, in addition to the camera store and other stuff, when I went to a wedding in the days of film, I took two different format cameras with me, okay? I took a 35 millimeter camera, so I took my Contax, at the time I was using a Contax uh, 159 and a Contax AX. So at that point, I had my 35 millimeter camera, I use that camera for pictures like the bride getting ready, for the reception pictures, for the groom getting ready, some of the candid stuff or candid photography. That's what I use. 35 millimeter cameras. Why? Because number one, I knew for a fact that no client was going to blow up 16 by 20 prints from the, from the reception or from, you know, getting ready pictures. On occasion, that did happen, and 35 still did a good job at that. Not a great job, but a good job. And that's what I want you to start thinking about, is there are different tools for the job. For example, for the pose pictures, so the pictures of the bride by herself, the groom by himself, the group family photos, for those types of pictures, I use the Hasselblad. Well, why? Can you guess? Bigger negative. So when you blew these up to big pictures, they were clearer, sharper. They were better quality for what the client wanted. Big prints. Now at the same time too, did I have weddings where the clients, even though I shot a medium format, they never printed really big photos? Absolutely. But I was prepared for the job with the tool that I needed for the result. So, and that's a key thing I think a lot of digital photographers and new photographers are missing out there. There is a difference between the tools for the job you bring and what the outcome is. You know, when you have a, a client come up to you and say, well, you know, how many megapixels is your camera? They're not, they don't really care, there might be a few, but they're not really asking you how good your camera is or what your megapixel camera is. What they're really asking you is, can you create 
quality images? That's what the real question comes down to. So sometimes by saying, well, yeah, I use a 60 megapixel camera, the client says, oh, okay, he's got a higher megapixel camera. That means it's better quality, so he'll get better pictures. Because still to this day, it is difficult for the client to separate the idea of better camera means better photographs. And that's just not necessarily the case. I mean, it is an element of that, but it's not the whole thing. For example, if I take this Hasselblad and you've never shot film before, you've never shot with a Hasselblad before, and I say, here you go, go shoot a wedding with this. Good luck. What are you gonna come back with? Good question. What would you come back with? Answer that question with yourself. Well, you're probably not gonna come out with great photos. If you've never shot film before, you've never used a Hasselblad before, you're probably not gonna get the best results, are you? Right. You need to be honest with yourself as a photographer. It, it's not about how many megapixel, how many megapixel the camera is, it's about your skill level and what you can accomplish with that camera. And that's something to keep in mind, okay? So what I did here is I laid out all my camera gear to talk to you about different formats and why these were used. So I'm gonna start with film, just so we can do a comparison of the world of photography. So here I've got basically three different formats of cameras sitting here in my film side of the, of the counter. So one thing to take note, all of these cameras, I've used all of them and still use most of them all the time. Probably out of all these cameras, the ones I use, I use the least is this one right over here, the Olympus Pen FT. And that's a film camera. It's an older one. I've got two lenses for it. I've got a 25 millimeter 2.8, which is this lens here. And then the standard, which comes with, which is like a 38, yep. And then the zoom that comes with it, which is kind of hard to find, but I put it out here because it's kind of neat to look at. So that is what we call a half frame camera. So what it is, it's a 35 millimeter size negative, but what Olympus did is they cut it in half. They're only using a tiny slice of that negative, not even a full, it's half. So let's say on a 12 exposure roll of film, you get 24 shots, half frame. Then we move up here to the Pentax, which is a full frame 35 millimeter camera. And then we have the Hasselblad in medium format camera. Though I'm gonna use this as another example of, huh, why do we do that? All right, we're calling Sony full frame cameras, right? Okay, well, does this mean that this Hasselblad doesn't use its full frame? <laughs> no. It's still using a full frame. So what are we calling these full frame? All Both these, even the Micro Four Thirds. This is full frame because it's using the full sensor. So I think that's kind of funny. So just a photographic term that I think is kind of humorous. Um, you may be like, what's he talking about? Mm, that's fine. But us old film guys know that. So this is one of the things. What we have here is different tools for the job. Does that mean this is better in some situations? No, not necessarily. Is this? No, not necessarily. It's just a different tool. Hi. <laughs> Daniel likes to get on the action sometimes. Hey, buddy. Yes, a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Okay, so with these three different cameras I have here in the film side of the, of the counter, we've got the 35 millimeter half frame camera, which means, for example, on a 24 exposure roll of film, you'd get 48 shots, okay? This camera was great for travel and for when you're wanting something lightweight and quick at that, in that era, because too, you could get twice as many exposures on a roll of film. Well, if you were traveling light, that was a real convenient thing to do. Also at the same, same time, it saved money because you used half as much film to take the same amount of, amount of photographs. You were also paying for half as much for your developing fees because same thing. It, it costs like a base fee to develop the roll of film and then they, they charge per print. So you might get a little more per print cost, 
but at the same time, you're using less film and you're using your, your cost of developing drops. Not the cost of printing per se, but the least cost of developing dropped, okay? So made for a great tool for that. Step up to the 35 millimeter. All right, these cameras were very quick. The cameras at the heyday of film could do 10 frames a second as far as, you know, shots. Now, remember, at 10 frames a second, the biggest roll of film you get was 36. Well, that means how long is that roll of film going to last you? Well, about 3.6 seconds. <laughs> so, of limited value unless you had a bulk film roll attached to your camera. For a lot of really high volume sports shooters, what they would have, and only you could do this only with certain cameras, you had a back that you would replace on the camera. For example, like on this one here, you can actually do that. Okay, so I'm gonna pull this off. There's a little lever right here. Whoops, it'll take me a minute because it's hard to get to. Okay, see, you can take the back off the camera and then there would be a bulk roll. So a roll that went inside here and over that had this big like cartridge here, like a drum. And you would drum fill those cameras and that way you could just keep shooting and shooting and shooting with a practically endless roll of film. So in that case for sports and action shooters, 35 millimeter was a huge leap in advancement from medium format cameras of that era too because whether it was autofocus or not, or manual focus, those were available for this type of camera system. Usually only for the professional level cameras, um, not just the consumer grade stuff, but that was there and that option was available to you, okay? And then you step up to the Hasselblad, of course, being a medium format camera. And I forgot to grab my dark slide so I could show you. It's a little easier to see the size of the film here, but I'll put my fingers on the corner. So that's how big the negative is very large negative. Now you only got on a cassette like this, the, the film backs, 12 exposures on a 120 roll of film. You could also buy a, a higher bulk film. Um, and I'm trying to remember the name of it. I think it was 620. That sounds right. But basically it was the same idea, but it, because they didn't wrap the film with paper, you got more exposures because they left out the paper side of it. Um, the disadvantage of that film is sometimes that film when you were loading it or unloading it was prone to light leaks. Because remember too, when you were loading these backs, you still had to be in subdued light. Otherwise, if you had really sensitive film, you'd ruin your film just changing the back or changing the film uh, you know, in and out of the backs. So something to keep in mind, a little piece of old film trivia there. Um, so same thing. Not good with sports, very slow focusing, because for many, many years, Hasselblad had no autofocus option. Now, they did very towards the end of, you know, um, medium format cameras. The, you did have a couple models that had autofocus. Um, briefly, uh, Contax had an autofocus uh, 645 format, which was basically a smaller negative, again, like the difference between these two. Um, f camera, but that didn't really last that long because at really that point um, a lot of wedding photographers were shooting 35 millimeter because also too the technology of film got so good you had films were practically grainless. One of the big films that really changed that was the Kodak's Ektar line of film. It was ultra fine grain film so even though it was slower film it was they had made a 25 and i think they made a 100 speed ektar i don't remember but that film was so fine grain it was almost like shooting medium format because it was so fine grain it was amazing so that technology didn't change the camera but it changed the way you shoot and what you could do with those with those frames of, of film now think about that a minute isn't that a lot similar to what's going on right now with digital photography? I think so. Because you still have the same kind of lineup with digital cameras. What drives me bonkers is that a lot of photographers will be like, well, you know, well, I only, you know, I, I want better quality, so I only use, you know, full format or full frame cameras. 
oh, you mean 35 millimeter format digital cameras opposed to a four thirds format. Um, because this is full frame, this is full frame, it's just the size of the sensor. So what it comes down to is these are simply different tools for the job. Does it mean that this is better than this? Again, in some situations, yes. In some, no. One of the things that really surprised me is just on uh, this last Friday, um, I went to go shoot a job for a local elementary school. Um, they had asked me to come and take some pictures of this uh, fiesta they were having. And just to try it out, I thought, I'm, I'm going to take my Panasonic along and I'm going to shoot with that alongside my, my Sony and see what I get. So I shot both camera systems. Now, for a little while, I took this out and I just used this for some photos. And I took this one and used this setup for a while. And then I compared the photos. I'm not pixel peeping, but I'm just comparing the overall look of the photos. Are they both good? Yes. Is exposure good? Yes. Are they detailed? Yes. Are the colors great? Yes. In both cases. So unless you're really splitting hairs, is this going to be better than this in that situation? Not really, no. I mean, you could easily print from the pictures I shot of that Fiesta, you could definitely print 8x10s, 11x14s, and 16x20s from any picture I took during that with either camera, and they're going to turn out great. Good detail. You know, good depth, depth within the image, good dynamic range. They're just different tools to the job. The one thing that made the big difference is with just this, two lenses, one body, and a battery grip because it was a long, you know, I didn't want to have to swap out batteries. Okay, from just here, I basically have from 24 millimeter wide angle all the way to 400 millimeter telephoto with just that. Okay? That's pretty convenient. What do I have to carry to get this exact range with my Sony? So, comparative camera, this lens, which is, you know, like that one there, plus this, and some of this lens, not all of it. This is a 2 to 600. So, this actually, whoops, don't want to have that hit the floor. So this is definitely much bigger than it was needed because this goes to 600, not 400. But this here and this here are similar kits as far as what they can do. Um, but if you're getting down to the brass tacks here, that, the same thing, you have to take the lens hoods off. That's very similar. And this has double the, double the range of this one. So to me, this is a better tool for that situation because with two lenses, I have from 24 to 400, while in this, I only have from 24 to 200. You know, that can make a difference when you're carrying it around for a long period of time. So what I want everyone to keep in mind is this type of situation where you're talking about micro four thirds, or you're talking about full frame 35 millimeter format digital cameras, or even the one part of this you don't see on my table, which is medium format or medium format digital cameras. They're all just good tools for us to use as photographers. The goal of photography, besides enjoying the craft yourself, and a little bit is the camera gear, I must admit, the gear is kind of a fun piece of this, but the real point of photography is coming back with great images that evoke emotion for our clients. That's what it's all about, right, Daniel? Hear my cat meowing over here in the corner. Oh yes, he's going to join us. What do you think? Is it more important about the gear? Is the gear more important as the or the picture? Which one do you think? See, he agrees. <laughs> so that's one thing I want you to keep in mind, okay? That in all of this, even though it's fun to talk about the gear and it's fun to talk about what the gear is capable of, we have to remember that what it comes down to is the quality of the photograph we're creating. 
So what we need to invest in is not our gear per se, though that's an important part of this whole thing. What really matters is the investment we make into ourselves into becoming better craftsmen of our professions and of our of creating images. That's what really matters. So what's the point of going through all this information with you and all these little details? What I want you to do is maybe come out of this with a perspective from a film photographer who grew up in this industry. Um, I'll make it brief. I won't give you the whole family history, but <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about my experience in photography. So I started shooting and being a part of the camera store growing up in it, no less. But I was working out front in the counter, selling film, making change for customers. I was there working in that camera store when I was about nine years old, let's say, even though I was there since the day I was born. And growing up in that camera store and growing up around photography, I learned some really, really specific lessons that have served me well for many, many years. And one of those really is the fact that when I, I mean, we service professional photographers and amateurs, people just going on vacation who just want a little point and snap camera. What it comes down to is any one of these tools, any one of these cameras, you can walk away with incredible results. We had this one customer, he was a very talented professional photographer, and you know what? He shot all of his pictures on just a Canon Rebel. And he was a professional photographer. He was, you know, his images were incredible. And all he used was a really cheap, inexpensive Canon Rebel 35 millimeter film camera and the kit lens it came with, which at the time was just a 35 to 80. That's it. It was a 3.5 to 5.6 lens. It was the cheapest thing you can get. And he created some of the most amazing portraits you've ever seen. And it wasn't about the camera. It was about his skill with that camera in lighting, in composition, in posing. That's what made the difference. So it didn't matter whether he was shooting with the cheapest camera you could get your hands on, or if it was, you know, he would use a really expensive one, which he didn't, because he figured, why? I don't need it. <laughs> My clients book me, they, they have big prints made from what I, what I shoot. Why do I need to buy something more expensive? Exactly. Just buy the best tool that you can for what your needs are, and then just stick with it. You know, the, the older I get, and the more I realize of how much actual camera gear I have, trust me, it's crazy. I have a lot. And one of these days, I'm going to do a video where I'm going to lay out every camera I own, and I'll do a video on it. But um, I'll have to take over the living room for probably two days and the floor. And I don't think my wife would be too excited about that if I take over the house for the weekend just to do a layout camera shoot with my whole gear set. But the more gear that you know, you have it that you've got in your bag too. It's more to keep track of. It's more to maintain. It's more to worry about. It's, well, what should I bring with me? What am I going to leave behind? It becomes this issue. So just buy what you need and that's it. And then hope you have an understanding spouse um, that allows you to keep it all. Thank you, honey. Um, so <laughs> anyway, what questions do you have about this? and camera gear and you know what what to use and when. Now I'm not saying I have all the answers, but I might be able to guide you in a direction um, that you'd be a little more interested in or might serve you better. You know, same thing. It's about experience and what you're doing. But the best investment you can make in camera gear, no matter what it, what it is, when it comes to the physical gear, invest in good lenses and good optics and just stick with it. Don't be too worried about, well, I'm going to shoot Sony now and then I'm going to switch to, you know, Panasonic or no, now I'm going to switch to Fujifilm. Don't worry too much about that flip-flop unless it really makes a difference in what you're creating. There's really no point. And I, one of the things I really wish is I wish the camera manufacturers listened to us a little bit more about what we really want. Do we really want or need more megapixel? Well, not really, because even with a 60 megapixel camera, 
or you know if you're using higher formats or you know higher megapixel camera can you really see the difference in a 16 by 20 print because same thing in my entire career of over 30 years of being a photographer me I've never had a client print anything larger than like a 24 by 36 print. I've printed things bigger than that for my living room just because I like big photographs when they're landscapes, stuff like that. But what does the average person order from you? If it's an 8 by 10, oh, for goodness sakes, you, should, you could be shooting with an 8 megapixel camera and not have to worry about it. Because for an 8 by 10 photo, you wouldn't need anything really more than 8 megapixel, really. So that's something to keep in mind. So regardless of the situation, just evaluate your gear and only get what you need. And same thing, if something's work, working for you and it's still working and it's not broken, just keep using it. Stick with it, hold on to it for a while. You know, make, get, your, get the most money out of that camera or lens that you can before you have to exchange it, resell it, or buy a different one. Keep that, you know, make that value there. Um, the other thing is, and the thing that's kind of hardest to describe, invest in your skill. Now, do I mean money? Not necessarily. Um, I'm workshops and, and things like that are definitely a value. Um, but take it with a grain of salt because there are going to be a lot of photographers out there, me included. They're going to give you advice that don't relate to you at all. That's okay, because you just have to take what you need from those, from those lessons. And also at the same time, if anything, learn good technique, learn composition, learn what you can do to utilize color in your scene to get better pictures. Um, there's so much you can do. Anyway, I'm gonna wrap this up so this video doesn't get too long because um, I can ramble on forever. But the point is, Focus on your photography, not on the gear. Thanks for watching, and I will, thanks for being a part of this, and uh, I hope to do another video for, video for you soon. Thank you so much. Bye. So Daniel, what, what would you like to add to this? Which is your favorite lens? You like the Zeiss? No, you like the Hasselblad? You're thinking about it. Okay. Well, you keep thinking, okay, buddy? Let me know when you're ready, all right? You let me know? Okay.